Hello, this is Yashveen. In this video, I'll be solving paper 2 variant 3 October number 2019, 9700 biology. 1 figure 1.1 is a diagram of a molecule of hemoglobin. A1, name the structure labeled A on figure. So A is a hemoglobin molecule where the shaded and not sh unshaded uh, structures would be polypeptide since there are four of them. And since the structure labeled A is not a part of that polypeptide, it would be the heme group of the molecule. To state the function of structure A, heme group carries uh, iron, which binds with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin to transport oxygen. B, hemoglobin is described as a globular protein. Explain why this protein is described as uh, globular. So you'd have to describe the features which are mentioned in the description of a globular protein. So these are spherical in shape with the hydrophobic R groups pointed inwards. So they would not be exposed to the aqueous surrounding, which uh, they are repelled by. And the hydrophilic R groups would be pointed outwards towards the aqueous environment where they'd form hydrogen bonds with water to form a soluble protein molecule. See the gene HBB codes for beta globin polypeptide. Suggest why a polypeptide such as beta globin is described as a polymer. Again, you'd use the um, terms mentioned in the definition of a polymer. So that would be a giant biological molecule made of uh, monomers. And because this question is specific to beta globin as a polymer, you'd have to write a feature that is specific to beta globin. And so its monomers would be amino acids. B, a single base change in DNA of the gene HBB results in a change to the amino acid sequence of beta globin. In the sequence, a single glutamic acid is replaced by a valine. Outline the effects of this change in the amino acid sequence of beta globin on the structure and the function of hemoglobin. Okay, so the base change um, of change in base of the nucleotide means that the triplet that is used to transcribe mRNA changes, and as a result, during the trans transcription process, uh, a new um, mRNA codon forms that in turn forms hydrogen bonds with a different tRNA molecule. And that tRNA molecule would be carrying valine instead of glutamic acid. So as a result, glutamic acid is replaced by valine. Now, as for your answer, glutamic acid uh, had a hydrophilic R group, which made it soluble in water. And that is the reason glutamic acid in the beta polypeptide of hemoglobin would have been present on the surface, is present on the sur surface of hemoglobin, so that it was able to form hydrogen bonds with water and uh, make the molecule soluble. Now that it's replaced by valine, which has a hydrophobic R group, this makes the um, molecule less soluble and it also makes the molecule less efficient at carrying oxygen by decreasing its affinity for oxygen and you can write that in your answer e hemoglobin interacts with carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide outline the role of hemoglobin in the transport of carbon dioxide so some of the carbon dioxide transported in the blood reacts with the terminal amine groups of hemoglobin to form carbamino hemoglobin and it, it then it is then removed in areas of high partial pressure of oxygen for hemoglobin to bind with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. Two meristematic tissue is found in the growing regions of plants such as root tips. Figure 2.1 shows a section through the meristematic region of a root tip of onion, Allium sepia. Table 2.1 shows the number of cells in different stages of cell cycles that were observed in sections of meristematic regions of root tips of a sepal. So you have G1, S phase and G2 phase all in interphase and then the rest of the stages of the mitotic cell cycle. A complete table 2.1 by using letters A to H from figure 2.1 to indicate one cell in, which the, in each stage of the cell cycle. Starting with interphase, in this phase, the chromosomes have not condensed, so you'd not be able to see these strands or visible chromosomes. It would just be a nucleus and, and that could be cells B and cell G. Prophase, in this phase, the chromosomes would have condensed, but they would not be aligned as they are supposed to be aligned in the metaphase, which follows prophase. 
nor would they be pulled apart like they would be in anaphase and so that cell would be cell a during metaphase the chromosomes would be aligned along this uh, equator of the spindle fiber and that would be cell d during anaphase the sister chromatids would be pulled apart like in cell e and f and during telophase you'd see that the structure of the chromatids would not be as distinctive and that would be in cell h b the total length of time taken for mastermatic cells of asap to complete one cycle at 25 degrees celsius is 12 hours Using sections similar to the one in figure 2.1, the length of time spent in each stage of the cell cycle can be estimated. To obtain the estimate, the percentage of cells in that stage is calculated. Using the data table 2.1, calculate the percentage of cells in anaphase and the mean length of time in minutes for anaphase, and you're supposed to show your work thing. So to calculate the percentage of cells in anaphase, you divide the number of cells in anaphase, uh, with the total number of cells and multiply the fraction with uh, a thousand and since you have mean you'd be using those values and so for anaphase that would mean 29 divided by the total number of cells which is 5000 multiplied by a hundred and that would give the answer as 0.58 percent of the total cells as for the mean length of time during anaphase you have the total number of cells which are 5000 that take 12 hours right so how many hours is going to be the time taken for 29 cells here you would use cross multiplication so that would mean to find x or the time taken for 29 cells in the inner phase you'd multiply uh, 29 with 12 and divide the numerator with 5000 and that would give you the answer as 0 0.0696 in hours and to convert that to minutes as the question asks you'd multiply that with 60 as each hour has 60 minutes and that would give the answer as 4.176 i'd correct it to two significant figures um, because my answer over here is also in two significant figures C state one event that occurs during cytokinesis in the cell cycle of plant cells, such as those shown in figure 2.1. Here, you, um, I'd prefer writing something that is a specific to cell cycle of plant cells. Um, so something which is distinct, which distinguishes a plant from an animal. So that would be their cell wall, since animals do not have that. So I'd be writing cell wall is laid down. 3a the tomato plant solanum lycopersicum does not tolerate periods of drought or water shortage in other words researchers have produced a tomato plant that has improved tolerance of drought the researchers measured the width and the length of open stomata in plants that are tolerant of drought and tomato plants that are not tolerant figure 3.1 is the for formula used to calculate the size of an open stomata also known as tomato aperture. So you divide the width of open stomata with the with its length. Figure 3.2 shows the minimal stomatal aperture of two groups of tomato plants. And figure 3.3 shows the rates of transpiration of two groups of tomato plants when kept in identical conditions of drought. So drought tolerant plants would have a lower mean stomatal aperture. So the opening of stomata would be of would be lower in size and it also has a lower rate of transpiration so lower water loss the water uptake of leafy shoots taken from two groups of tomato plants was measured using photometers the leafy shoots were of similar mass and had the same number of leaves the results are shown in figure 3.4 okay so as you can see the drought tolerant uh, plants marked by the cross would have a lower mean uptake of uh, water whereas not drought tolerant plants would have a higher mean water uptake with reference to figure 3.2 3.3 and 3.4 describe and explain describe and explain the difference between the plants that are drought tolerant and plants that are non-drought tolerant 
This question is entirely of five marks, two of which you can use to describe and there are three uh, you can use for explanation part. For description, you can uh, describe how drought tolerant plant have lower mean stomatal aperture, transpiration rate and lower mean water uptake. And as for the second mark of description, I'd have to quote some data. And for that one, you can choose any of the three features of the two plants and compare between the two plants. For example, for mean stomatal, I can uh, write down how drought tolerant plants have a rate of have a mean stomatal aperture of 0 0.19, whereas non drought tolerant plants have a mean stomatal aperture of 0.35. Similarly, you can compare between the transpiration rates or the mean water uptake. Any one would be sufficient to gain one mark for quoting the data. Now, coming to the um, explanation part, we'll start with the first figure. As drought tolerant plants have a lower mean stomatal aperture. That means the inside of the leaf is less exposed to the outside. And what that does is it reduces the water potential gradient between the structure of the leaf and the air outside, which makes the rate of diffusion of water vapor from the leaf through stomata lower in um, drought tolerant plants. And that means uh, during transpiration, the Evaporation of water vapor from cell walls of spongy mesophyll cells into the air spaces decreases, and uh, that is followed by a lower rate of diffusion of water vapor in the air space through the stomata. And because less water vapor is lost by the plant, the mean water uptake is also lower by drought tolerant plants. So you'd have to use the sequence in your answer as um, hinted by these figures. The nuclei of plants produce small, small lengths of RNA known as microRNAs. MicroRNAs in guard cells have been shown to prevent the synthesis of some proteins. So they play some role in preventing protein synthesis. The guard cells of drought tolerant tomato plants produce more microRNA molecules than the guard cells of non tolerant plants. MicroRNA molecules do not prevent transcription but interact with messenger RNA. So just how this microRNA can interact with messenger RNA to prevent the production of proteins in guard cells of S. lycopersicum. So the question first of all tells us that microRNAs play some role in prevention of protein synthesis. And this protein synthesis consists of two stages, transcription and translation. MicroRNA molecules do not prevent transcription. That means they have to do something with preventing the translation stage where um, mRNA is translated into a polypeptide by transfer RNA molecules. It is also given in the question that they interact with messenger RNA. So after transcription has been completed, the microRNA molecules interact with messenger RNA and that uh, possibly means that the basis on microRNA molecules um, would be when complementary to messenger RNA molecules bind with them and that prevents the binding hydrogen bond formation between the codon of mRNA with tRNA and which in turn means that anticodons or tRNA are not able to bind with codons on mRNA and this leads to prevention in protein synthesis as translation process of the as translation is not completed. For in mammals, arteries branch to form smaller blood vessels called arterioles. Arterioles branch to form capillaries that supply blood to tissues. A explain the ways in which the structure of an artery is adapted to its function. The artery consists of three layers, which would be tunica, intima, media, and externa. Starting with the innermost layer, tunica intima is a, is a smooth layer, and this reduces the friction to blood flow in the lumen of the artery. Uh, moving to tunica media, it consists of a smooth muscle, collagen fibers, and elastic fibers, each of which has a particular function. 
the collagen fibers give strength due to their the tensile strength of the molecule and this prevents bursting of arteries elastic fibers allow the arteries to stretch and recoil with the pulse of the blood to maintain the blood pressure and smooth muscles contract and relax which varies the diameter of the artery that causes vasoconstriction and vasodilation as required to regulate blood flow to the uh, parts of the body. Figure 4.1 shows transmission electron micrographs of cross sections through an arter arteriole and a capillary. So here is an arteriole and a capillary where arteriole a has a lower magnification than the capillary. B1 identify the cells in the lumen of arteriole and state one reason for your identification. So these cells which are darker in color than any of these structures. I'd say these are blood cells due to their biconcave disc shape. To describe differences between the arteriole and capillary that are visible in figure 4.1. Let's start with the innermost layer. Obviously, arteriole, as you can see, has um, a greater number of, it has multiple red blood cells, whereas a capillary only carries one uh, red blood cell. Moving on in the capillary, moving on in the arteriole, you have multiple nuclei, these structures represent the nuclei, which are projected into the lumen of the artery, whereas there are no projections in the lumen of the capillary. Similarly, uh, an arteriole has a wider lumen as compared to capillary. You might not be able to see that because arteriole has a lower magnification and they seem to be the same lumen size because capillary is uh, has greater magnification in this image and as for the fourth point the arteriole has a much thicker wall whereas capillary has a much thinner wall as it's only composed of endothelial cells figure 4.2 shows a capillary network in a mammal in a mammalian tissue the arrows indicate the direction of flow of bodily fluids of body fluids so these fluids would um, consist of blood, the tissue fluid as well. C1 capillaries have a role in the formation of tissue fluid. Explain how tissue fluid is formed in the capillary network. Whenever you, uh, the question um, requires the answer regarding formation of tissue fluid, the keyword you'd have to use is ultrafiltration. This occurs when blood plasma leaks out of the capillaries through the through the gaps in the endothelial cells that make up the capillary walls and tissue fluid forms when that occurs along with um, movement of small molecules like glucose amino acids of the capillary and into the plasma the red blood cells and larger plasma protein molecules are not able to move out Two, the vessels labeled X in figure 4.2 carry excess tissue fluid back into the circulatory system. Name the fluid inside the vessels labeled X and state one way in which its composition is in which its composition differs from blood plasma. So X is not a part of the circulatory system, meaning it has to be a lymphatic vessel, so it would be carrying lymph. This lymph does not have the plasma proteins that were not able to escape the uh, capillaries in the first place since they were too large to leave the capillary. Five, influenza is an infectious disease caused by influenza A virus. The virus causes influenza in birds and mammals. Figure 5.1 is a diagram of an influenza A virus. Hemagglutinin allows the virus to attach to the, to the host cells by binding to receptors on the surface membrane of the host cells. So here is the structure and neuraminidase is an enzyme that helps the virus to leave host cells after the virus has replicated so that the virus would be able to enter other cells and replicate in there. A state two features of all viruses that are visible in figure 5.1 that would be protein code and either DNA or RNA. Neuraminidase removes parts of the host cell receptors that bind to hemagglutinin. This helps newly formed viruses to leave host cells. Drugs have been developed to act on neuraminidase. These drugs prevent viruses from leaving host cells. So just explain how these drugs act to prevent viruses leaving host cells. 
Neuraminidase, as mentioned by the question, is an enzyme. The virus leaving the host cell was dependent on the action of neuraminidase. And if the if their exit is prevented, that means the drug affect neuraminidase enzyme. And that means uh, to prevent an enzyme, you'd have to use an enzyme inhibitor, which in turn means that these drugs used to control the activity of neuraminidase are um, enzyme inhibitors, either competitive or non-competitive. So neuraminidase would be um, inhibited by the drugs acting as competitive inhibitors, they'd bind to. And for that to happen, the drugs would have to have a shape that would be complementary to the active site of neuraminidase. They'd bind to the active site and they would prevent the formation of enzyme substrate complex. In other words, they would prevent the action of neuraminidase and that would mean the virus would not be able to leave the host cell. The human immune system produces antibodies in response to presence of antigens such as neuraminidase and hemagglutinin. Outline the effects that occur during an immune response leading to the production of antibodies against an antigen such as hemagglutinin. Antibodies would be produced by beta lymphocytes and that would form that could happen when either B lymphocytes produce it themselves or by um, the stimulation of beta lymphocytes by secretion of cytokines from helper T cells. So once the antigen enters the body it would by antigen presentation of the virus the beta lymphocytes that have receptors complementary to the shape of this antigen would undergo clonal selection and clonal expansion as in they divide by mitosis and then they'd form plasma cells to secrete antibodies T helper lymphocyte cells would secrete cytokines that would stimulate B cells to form plasma cells and then secrete antibodies The researchers are developing methods to produce antibodies to give artificial passive immunity to influenza. Suggested advantages and disadvantages of artificial passive immunity. So these antibodies would be directly infect, uh, injected into the person's body. As in the person would not have to wait for the immune uh, system to carry out an immune response for the production of antibodies which can take a long time. And that means this the, the artificial passive immunity would provide antibodies faster compared to other and the um, active immunity. And as for the disadvantages, it is not a long term immunity because as the as there was no immune response carried out, no memory cells were made. And so the person has short term immunity. Two state two ways in which mammals can acquire natural passive immunity to infectious diseases such as influenza. So natural passive immunity um, meaning means acquiring passive immunity would mean acquiring antibodies directly without the antigen entering the body first. And if it's natural, that means it would be the two the two ways would be by feeding on breast milk or the antibodies reaching um, fetus across the placenta. 6. Figure 6.1 is a diagram of the cell surface membrane of a squamous epithelium of a squamous epithelial cell lining an alveolus. A1. A student measured the line AB and calculated the width of the membrane in figure 6.1. So the unit that the student should use for the actual width of the membrane. The unit used should be nanometers. Two, with reference to figure 6.1, state how to identify the external surface of the cell surface membrane. The external surface is the only surface that has these projections into the um, environment, which would act as antigens or receptors. Name R and S in figure 6.1 and describe their roles in the membrane. R, as you can see, is um, not present in an abundant amount in the membrane in this figure and so R has to be a cholesterol and this regulates fluidity preventing the membrane from becoming too fluid and or too rigid whereas S is a phospholipid molecule that prevents the prevents movement of 
polar molecules across the membrane due to the fact that they have hydrophobic fatty acid tails. This is it. We are done with this paper. Thank you for watching.